talking today. It's my privilege and uh, pleasure to introduce Professor Yaki, who's a professor of law at the UW uh, Law School. His re uh, research centers on international investment law, international economic relations, foreign arbitration, and administrative law and politics. He offers courses on contracts, uh, international investment law, international arbitration, and international business transactions. Professor Yaki earned uh, his MA and his PhD in political science and international relations from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the JD or doctorate in jurisprudence, summa cum laude, from the university, from the Duke University School of Law, uh, where he was also an editor for the Duke Law uh, Journal. He has also studied French and European law at uh, l'Université uh, Panthéon Assa, Paris 2, or Paris 2 and uh, was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship to conduct research at the Tamasat University Faculty of Law in ba Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, Professor Yaki has published several articles in peer-reviewed social science journals, law reviews, and edited volumes, including the George Washington Law Review, the Harvard International Ro Law Review, uh, the Virginia Journal of International Law, and he has presented this research widely, both in the US and abroad. His um, scholarship has been funded by the National Science Foundation and has garnered both accolades and scholarly prizes for excellence. In addition, Professor Yaki's research on choice of court clauses in international commercial contracts has been cited by two US circuit courts. Professor uh, Yaki um, is currently working on a major historical product that, uh, I'm sorry, on a major historical project that uses archival research to explore Franco-African diplomacy over nationalization and expropriation disputes in the 1960s and 1970s. And he also is also interested in analyzing the French government's use of diplomatic and legal means to protect its foreign investors in Africa. The paper he's presenting today, uh, whose title you saw, Expelling the Sinister Villegrain, Nationalization, Diplomacy and Sugar in the People's Republic of Congo, 1970 to 1978, this paper is an article-length version of one of the planned uh, book chapters. We're very um, happy to welcome uh, Professor Yaki to our community of Africanist scholars. And please uh, help me give him a warm, alas, virtual welcome. Um, and the floor is yours, Professor Yaki. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Luis, so much for that um, very kind introduction. It's a real pleasure for me to um, to uh, present to, to this group. Um, I'd like to, to thank especially um, Aaliyah McCord, who's been, um, I think, very uh, very welcoming to me as I have um, reinvented myself uh, somewhat post-tenure um, as um, an historian, although I'm not formally trained as one, and also as an Africanist, and I'm not formally trained as an Africanist. And so she has been very indulgent as I have learned more about, um, more about your world. And so I really greatly appreciate the chance to share my research with you. I hope that it's not too oddball in its um, approach or, or conclusions. Um, it's hard to beat the law out of the lawyer. And so there is a legal element to, to what I do. I hope that what I say is interesting and, and hopefully not controversial um, it, it, uh, in, in, in any way. Um, I don't think it is, but I hope maybe to, to challenge some, um, uh, some conventional wisdoms at the margins. Um, as Luis mentioned, and I'll share my slides in a minute, um, the, the paper, um, is an article um, uh, uh, version of, of what I hope to be a, a book chapter. So the article came out recently in the um, uh, French Historical Studies. Um, I'll share my slide, my slides right now. Screen. Okay. So, well, give me for give me just one minute to get this going. Perfect. Um, and so this article recently came out in French Historical Studies, um, and it's part of a, a series of, of similar um, case studies that I've, I've done over the past couple of years with the aim of eventually putting them, to, putting them into a larger book project, um, basically on the subject of, uh, of this article, but involving some other countries. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm sort of manic depressive, maybe it's COVID about the book project. Sometimes I'm enthusiastic, other times I'm not. Um, I'd love to get your sort of input and advice sort of on the project generally. Um, and you can help me decide if I wanna be manic or depressive about the book project today. Um, and so uh, the, um, the article um, uh, focuses on what I, what I found to be a really interesting um, uh, period in Franco um, Congolese and so Congo Brazzaville, 
relations in the late 60s and early um, 1970s surrounding the, the sugar industry and um, both the Congo's decision to expropriate and nationalize that industry, but then also the, um, the attempts by the French investor to gain compensation uh, for their expropriation. And I'll talk in a bit, um, in, in a couple of slides as to sort of what interesting sort of questions and aspects and themes um, this episode as an example of sort of a larger class of expropriation episodes in the post-independence period, um, you know, what questions um, they, they raise and, and, and possibly allow us to, um, to answer. I mean, so just to, to set the stage, I wanted to, to step back um, and give you a sense of where I'm coming at um, this project from in terms of my larger and sort of more traditional um, uh, academic background. And so I'm trained as, as a lawyer and somebody who studied international political economy, uh, IPE in, in short. And in the IPE literature, um, there's a sub literature that focuses on what's viewed as this core problem of international relations, um, which is how foreign investors can protect themselves against uh, what you might broadly call mistreatment by the host state. And by host state, we mean the, the government of the, of the territory of the state in which that foreign investor has invested. And so, you know, think, for example, of, um, you know, U.S. oil investors in Mexico in 1938. They're faced with the possibility of nationalization without uh, uh, compensation. Um, what can they do to protect themselves from that happening? Or once the mistreatment has happened, what recourse do they have after the fact? Um, and uh, political scientists and economists that study the foreign investment uh, area and that focus on this problem, they generally identify two broad classes of solutions. Um, you know, both can be characterized as institutions. Um, one's more formal than the other. And so informally, um, people talk a lot about um, what I'll call politicized dispute settlement. And so uh, those are things like um, diplomatic protection. And so using sort of diplomats and diplomacy to um, pursue a private investor's um, cause, you know, in negotiations, for example, with the, um, with the, the host state. Uh, gunboat diplomacy is, is often mentioned as being the primary tool um, in the diplomatic arsenal of countries like France, uh, uh, the UK, the United States, um, especially in the pre-World War II years. Uh, scholars have increasingly emphasized the use of international courts and law as a way to, to legalize and pacify um, that formerly politicized dispute settlement process. Um, and so the, the, the slide here, I've attempted to make it a bit more graphically interesting since we're on, on Zoom. We have this very famous um, uh, editorial cartoon by William Allen Rogers um, showing Teddy Roosevelt carrying his big stick as he tugs a line of um, gunboats around the Caribbean, um, encouraging the Caribbean states to pay their foreign, um, foreign debts. A great example of that sort of classic image of gunboat diplomacy. Um, so today, we, we live in a, a very different world. And so this slide is titled present and past. Um, the, the presence on the, on, on the left. And so in the last 30 years, we've seen um, the development of a, um, a very formal and robust system of international courts, arbitral tribunals and international law that allow, that give investors really meaningful rights to, um, uh, to sue, um, to invoke legal action and, um, against um, states that have violated the investors' interests. And so this has led to um, essentially an explosion of um, what are called investor state arbitrations, including in Africa. Um, and so in the, in the past, you know, you'd have um, mistreatment of various kinds. The investor would also just um, take its lumps and, and, and not make a fuss, or they would make a fuss to their government. And, and, and who knows what would happen behind the diplomatic curtain. These days you have this very sort of transparent and increasingly transparent, not perfectly, but increasingly transparent arbitral system where you have formal legal complaints that are decided by panels of private judges. They issue awards that are enforceable. Um, uh, the investor, if they win, can seize assets from the, um, from the host state. Um, and so, uh, especially in the Maghreb, so Algeria, Libya, Egypt, you've seen a lot of litigation 
under international law, but also you see um, uh, these kinds of lawsuits spread around the continent, you know, including I think most infamously, there was a challenge to South Africa's black empowerment legislation, which entailed setting aside ownership shares for, um, uh, for, uh, for, for um, in, in, in foreign companies for, uh, for black and colored um, uh, people. Um, on the right, we have the past, and it's not the Congo yet, we're getting there, but it's, it's a nice um, uh, a painting of the construction of the Suez Canal. Why the Suez Canal? Um, and so this is how I got into this area of study. I came across kind of randomly um, uh, an obscure dispute between uh, Ferdinand de Lesseps and his, his company, the Suez Canal Company, and the Khedive of Egypt um, over the withdrawal of corvée labor. labor. And so we see an image of corvée labor. The Khedive actually ended the practice in the middle of construction, um, totally disrupting the financial equilibrium of the project and causing um, a pretty severe, um, a pretty serious dispute between France, Egypt, and between um, Lesseps and his company. Um, and so I, I was curious. I did some background research, a lot of archival research in, in France, and found that this episode, which was um, resolved through diplomacy, also had a surprisingly sort of legalized um, uh, procedure that was followed. And in fact, it was arbitrated by Napoleon III um, through a very legalized process. It led to um, a, a judgment in Lesseps' favor. Um, and with that judgment, Lesseps was able to salvage his relationship um, with Egypt uh, and to complete the, the, the grand project. And so that study, which was published in a, um, in a legal journal, um, really got me curious about um, you know, learning more about how these kinds of in foreign investment disputes were in fact resolved before this current area, the present era of a highly legalized dispute settlement process. And so in other words, was pre-legal pre methods for resolving the tensions that almost inevitably arise in complex foreign investments between the investor and the host state, you know, was it possible for diplomacy broadly construed to actually be effective and maybe even more effective than law at um, resolving the dispute in a compromised kind of way while also so, uh, saving um, what could be a productive relationship between the various parties involved. Um, and so after completing the Suez project, um, I started thinking more seriously about um, France's um, post-colonial involvement, um, so post-1960 um, involvement in Africa. Um, and I knew that there were at least a handful of um, important and, um, and seemingly interesting expropriations and nationalizations um, in various um, former colonies of France. Um, and the, the archival uh, material, especially in the diplomatic archives in, in France, and so there, there are two main archives that I end up um, using, um, the Archive Nationale um, in, uh, in Paris and Pierre Fitte. And then you have the diplomatic archives, which are based um, uh, both in Nantes um, and, uh, and just north, um, uh, just north of, of Paris. Uh, and so the, um, the French um, access laws are, are roughly 40 or 50 years for a lot of this stuff. And we're just reaching the time where documents from the 60s and 70s um, are, are becoming um, both available, but also um, itemized into, um, uh, into uh, inventories. Um, and so quite accessible. And so one of the disputes that I came across um, was this dispute over expropriation, nationalization, um, in the Congo, um, Republic of Congo's um, sh sugar sector. Um, and so I use this case along with a, a, um, some others that I'm happy to talk about, one in, involving Mauritania um, and expropriation in the iron ore industry. Um, I use these archives to address um, a, a number of, of, of questions really from an inductive kind of way. And so I don't go into the project with um, a pre-existing theory. In political science, you would often um, have, or at least claim to have, a pre-existing pre theory that you're, that you're testing. Um, I was really purely inductive. I didn't know what I was gonna find in the archives. And I think that's, that's pretty normal as far as I can tell with um, historical research. And so I ended up looking at, you know, I was interested in, in exploring, um, you know, why post-colonial states did expro expropriate. Um, there seems to be a sense that it was widespread, um, but, but why did they engage in it? It was it economically, 
um, rational in some sense, um, particularly in the sense of opportunism, which is a particular concept of, um, a, a, of a group of scholars called the New Institutional Economics. Um, I can talk more about op what opportunism means, but we can think about it just informally as sort of economic rationality. Um, uh, were the reasons ideological. And so, of course, you know, as in the Congo, you have at least a veneer of, of, of Marxism Leninism. Um, did the ideas um, that the leaders claim to hold about how the world works and how the state should relate to the economy, is that what drove things? Or were there other political reasons um, behind expropriation decisions? So that, that's sort of one big question. Um, and then the, the second question was, you know, it was how um, non-legalized or politicized diplomatic dispute settlement around these expropriations actually worked. And so I was interested in looking at the, the tools that investors um, had um, in this earlier era to protect themselves. Um, I was interested in looking at how the French state um, might have helped or, or hindered, even hindered possibly its investors in resolving expropriation disputes. And I was interested in getting a sense of how successful politicized or diplomatic dispute settlement was at preserving what, what might be um, considered mutually beneficial um, economic and political relationships. And so there's an idea um, in, in law that, 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 that invoking your legal rights often um, can destroy relationships and embitters both sides to the dispute. Um, it creates clear winners and losers. It may reduce the incentive to, to compromise. And so that, that literature was in the, in, the, in the back of my head as I started looking at, um, looking at these various disputes. Um, and more, um, more abstractly, um, one of the things I became interested in as I started to do the, the research was this idea of what I call post-colonial in entanglements. Um, and the idea here is, is not, not, not super original on, on my part, but it's really inspired by um, works by um, a, a number of scholars that I found to be quite interesting as I started doing, um, doing reading in the, in, in the, in the, um, in the uh, decolonization and the post-colonization um, uh, literatures. Um, and so we have first um, Professor um, Phil Naylor at Marquette University. Um, who's written a lot about um, Algeria's nationalization of the hydrocarbon sector, which was obviously French dominated. Um, and the story that he um, tells is really quite, quite interesting. Um, I, I won't get into it because it's not my topic today, um, but he emphasizes um, Franco-Algerian relationships as, um, or really the de decolonization um, of that relationship as involving um, paradoxes, right? And he describes, um, he describes that process of decolonization um, as a process through which Algeria and France had to renegotiate a complex and multifaceted relationship. Um, Tony Schaefer, who teaches in, in, um, in England, I think he's at, um, at uh, Portsmouth, um, you know, he discusses um, decolonization as, and I'll quote here, a constant process of negotiation in which the parties became implicated and in which they were mutually shaped um, by, um, by each other. Um, as I did um, or dived into um, uh, the archival research, I began to suspect or realize that expropriation disputes could serve as, um, I think a really neat and informative um, micro illustration, um, micro or maybe something higher than micro, but not macro, um, a, a really neat micro illustration of this idea of mutual implication of mutual shaping of renegotiate, renegotiating these, complexly entangled relationships. Um, expropriation, of, expropriation events are especially interesting because they bring into the picture um, a, a third party who's often um, uh, conflated with the state and that is the private, um, the private capitalist or the private investor. And I'll talk more about this in a minute, but um, expropriation disputes are really interesting for you know, giving us a tripartite relationship to and, and renegotiation, um, mutual shaping. To, to analyze, which is really distinct, I think, from the traditional sort of colonized or colonized um, uh, bilateral analysis that we see in a lot of the works that are out there. Um, so let me just give you a very brief overview um, of, um, of the chronology of the episode that, that I'm looking at. And in the course of the chronology, I'll give you a sense of 
uh, of the substance. Um, you'll know that I'm not um, an historian, and so I'm not reading my, my account. I think there are actually a lot of benefits from reading um, these sort of rich case studies. Um, I, I hope my article is a rich case study. I think it is. Um, and so I'm definitely going to leave out a lot of sort of interesting detail. I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. But since I'm not, not reading, um, I, I'm going to keep things relatively, um, relatively simple. Um, and so we start in 1929, and you have a French colonist um, who gets a concession uh, in the Niari Valley um, in the central part of um, what would become the, the Republic of the Congo. It's actually quite quite large, I mean, compared to certainly to a to Wisconsin farm. Um, and so the, the concession is about 49,000 um, uh, acres. Uh, it, it, in all, the colonist, um, one uh, Otino or Atino, he doesn't do much with the concession. This is not atypical, actually. Um, if you look at the history of investment in the colonies and particularly in, um, uh, it, in the Congo, you, you see that concessionaires rarely um, actually invested very much in their operations. And so Atino doesn't seem to have done much at all. The, the, the grounds were essentially fallow um, up to the, the, the post-war period. It's in that post-war period when you see um, uh, major established um, French capitalists. And here, um, the, the Vilgrain family, which owned the Grand Moulin de, de, de Paris, a, a major um, French milling company, um, begin to take an interest in expanding their, their, their milling and, and other relations um, uh, in the African colonies. Um, and so they end up, GMP, Grand Moulin de Paris, ends up buying um, Otino's concession for what um, one of the, uh, the, the company's officers described as a bouche de pain, a, a mouthful of bread, a very small price, but a small price that might actually have been um, fair given that the land was essentially undeveloped. Um, and so um, G GMP's original idea for the concession was to grow soybeans um, for, for animal feed, um, but they quickly changed their focus to, um, to creating a, um, a sugar industry. Um, there's a mill on site, and so they're going to grow sugar cane, they're going to harvest it, and they're going to crush it as, as you would do given the volume um, of, of, the, uh, of the crop and produce sugar for the local, um, for the local market and for markets other, elsewhere in, in Africa. Um, and so by 1962, the company, um, which was um, called uh, Cian, um, the Société Industrielle Agricole du Niari, um, it's established and operating. I mean, it's interesting because the company is both owned by GMP, but the French government, um, through, um, uh, through um, uh, one of its aid agencies, owns uh, actually a, a quite a large share as well. Um, because the company was founded before independence, uh, the Congolese government does not have any shareholdings. And so the company is owned independently of the independent Congolese um, state. But operations, at least in these early years, are, are quite remarkable. Um, and in fact, they're described in contemporaneous reports as being a, remarkably, a, a remarkable success. And so the, um, the company is producing tons upon tons of sugar, Sugar prices are pretty high at the time. Um, and the company's also worried about the, um, the socialization, uh, meaning the, uh, the government takeover by the newly independent Congolese government of the operations. And so as a way to diffuse that risk, um, and because sugar prices are relatively high, um, the Vilgrain family, um, the company decides to expand operations by creating a second sort of sister company. Um, called Sosuniari, so and I, um, I did not write down the acronym, and it's too long to, to, for us to worry about. Um, Sosuniari um, is quite different from Sion, even though it's engaged in essentially the same activities, because the Congolese government is a shareholder, a major, um, a major shareholder in, um, in the company. And so this is a way to allow um, the Congolese government to, to more directly profit from the industry. Um, now, the Congolese government ends up guaranteeing, so it's a shareholder, but also guarantees um, a large chunk of the debt of the new company, which is a very important point. So, um, very, very poor timing um, on the shareholder's part because sugar prices quickly collapse to historical lows. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Cuba is putting a lot of sugar on the market, um, the International Sugar Agreement. Um, uh, 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 collapses. Um, 
And so the, the new company, NCN itself, the original company, they quickly fall into very, very serious financial difficulty, um, uh, which I'll come back to in a minute. In 68, we have, um, we have our, 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 our coup, I will apologize, the NG gives me um, quite a bit of pronunciation trouble, but Ngoabi um, uh, deposes Masamba Deba. Um, in 69, you begin to see an increase in worker un unrest um, in, the, in the cane fields. You have had massive migration into, the, um, into, into Brazzaville. Um, the, the workers in, in Jacob, um, the, the, um, the town where, uh, where the cane fields are, are located, um, they're agitating for um, greater management role, for higher pay, better work conditions. There's reports of sabotage and worker delay. Um, the company had used in the past Congolese security services to suppress um, labor, um, labor unrest. Um, and in, you know, by 1969, it, it seems to, that things have been spiraling out of control to a point where that may no longer be, um, be possible. Um, and so in 1970, the government decides to nationalize, to take over operations. And so they kick out, they literally kick out of the country, Gilgrin and the, the European um, uh, management, they seize the shares and they put them into a brand new company um, called SIA, um, SIA Congo, uh, which will now run, run the operations. Um, and my, my work really focuses on this, on, you know, the, on the period of time really starting with that nationalization um, through 1978, which is when we finally have a settlement accord signed. Um, and so the period 1970 to 1977, you know, in my chronology, I have left it kind of um, left it largely blank, but there's a lot happening um, there that we can talk about. Um, three things, I, I suppose, that I'll mention right, right now. Um, and so Villegrin, representing the shareholders um, in the company, um, is, is hopping mad. He's hopping mad because his assets were seized and he wasn't paid anything. And so the Congolese government makes um, motions at the beginning that you know, makes statements, I should say, um, acknowledging that it should pay compensation to expropriated shareholders. This is a, a well-established, um, if abstract, right under international um, law, but the compensation never gets paid. The Villegrin lobbies um, ferociously, the French government, um, even the the World Bank, um, who he seeks to convince to stop lending um, to the Congo um, in order to increase pressure upon the Congolese government um, to, to pay him what he thinks um, he, is, uh, he is due. Um, the Congolese government very quickly settles some of its claims, but with French institutions, um, and in particular, an institution called COFACE. Well, COFACE is the primary export guarantee agency in France. Um, it, it still exists uh, today. It was also highly politicized at the time and also really quite essential for allowing France's um, former colonies to um, afford um, generally almost always French goods, so imports from France that were part of large investment and development projects. And so the Congolese officials realized very quickly that they can't survive without co-face funding and so they settle their co-face debts to the French government. But they think they can survive without Villegrin and his, um, and his capital. Um, and so they refuse to pay him. A really fascinating part of the story, and one that I'll get into in a bit um, more detail in a couple of minutes, is that Villegrin's efforts to lobby the French government also fall upon essentially deaf ears. And so the French government, for various reasons, really rebuffs um, his attempts to convince the government to come down hard on um, on the Congolese government um, on, his, on his behalf. Now, unfortunately for the Congolese, um, you know, things go from, um, from, from bad to worse um, almost a, a, immediately on an operational level. Um, and so, um, and so um, Nguabi in, in, um, finds himself vis-a-vis um, -vis the Congolese labor in much the same situation as the French, right? Um, and so even though he is, um, at least pre presents himself as a, um, a Marxist-Leninist. Um, he has very severe labor trouble and has to use his armed forces to suppress um, labor revolt um, in, uh, in the fields. And so labor management relations don't, don't, don't improve, which has consequences for productivity. Um, you also see the Congolese uh, management um, really unable to keep the fields and the operations running as a profitable, a profitable concern. And so they make 
poor decisions as to field maintenance. And so one of the examples you find in the records is that to make a labor easier, they burn off the old cane. Um, that causes lots of problems. It increases erosion, and it also allows um, invasive grasses to, in, uh, to, well, invasive grasses to invade, um, to invade the sugarcane fields. Um, they have trouble maintaining their um, French machinery. And so um, Sian had, had bought um, machines called turbo alternators. I'm not sure what exactly they're used for, but they're really important for the operations of the mill. Um, uh, and um, from a, a company called Fiv Lille, um, those machines start to break down. And so the Congolese need Fiv Lille to, to send them um, replacement parts. Fiv Lille refuses to, to, to do so. Um, it, probably a wise decision given how chronically unstable the government's finances were, without those replacement parts, um, the, 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 the mill is, is virtually unable to, to, to run. And so as things wear out, you know, the Congolese government need help from France, technology, um, administrative expertise, that kind of thing that they're, that they're frankly unable to get. Um, and so sugar um, uh, uh, production collapses, and it's really, I'm looking at my notes for the exact number, it's really quite, um, quite striking. And so in 1969, um, the, the mills produced the 97,000 tons of sugar. Um, by 1974, it was down to about 28,000 tons. And um, by the late 70s, so 77, 78, we're down to like 10,000 tons. Um, and so this previously profitable enterprise um, is, is actually costing the Congolese money in, in terms of lost profit, but also um, uh, it's not even covering the cost of, of of, of running the enterprise. And so it ends up being quite a huge um, disaster. Um, in the background, Villegrin and, and his company um, uh, are agitating to get back into um, the, the industry, um, but again, contingent upon getting some sort of compensation, um, which perhaps could be adjusted you know, in re, you know, to reflect um, uh, new opportunities to, to make money in the country. Um, uh, things remained at a standstill um, in, in, until Ngabi's assassination in 1977, right? So here we have a great example of how um, uh, how, um, how how personalized um, uh, 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 post-colonial relations um, could, could, could be. Um, here, it made a big difference um, in terms of uh, Vilgrand's efforts to get compensation to re-enter um, the, the Congolese sugar industry. Um, that he be able to work with new leadership. And so soon after the um, negotiation, I'm sorry, the assassination, um, we see informal and then quickly formal efforts to negotiate um, a uh, compensation settlement um, with the CN shareholders. And so with Bill Grant, the private shareholders and the nationalized um, companies. Uh, those formal negotiations begin in 1977 um, initially, both the Congolese and, um, and Villegrin wanted the French government to be a party to, the, in fact, the primary party to the negotiations. And so there was this idea that the negotiations um, really needed to be resolved on a state to state level. In fact, the French government um, uh, uh, decides to, to remain in the background. Um, it wants to present these negotiations as purely between the private investors, the shareholders, um, and the Congolese government, although the French government plays a supporting role sort of in the, um, in the background. And very, very quickly, a settlement accord is signed, and it's one that gives um, Villegrin and the shareholders most, about 89% um, of what they originally um, asked for in compensation. So there was an attempt to fight over how to value what was seized, um, an attempt to put a, a monetary value on it, it um, and then there was a decision that, hey, what we took was worth about this. Would you take this? Um, and that 89% of the original sort of ask by the shareholders um, seems really actually quite, um, uh, quite, um, quite generous from the shareholders' perspective. Um, now, the Congo doesn't, doesn't in the end, allow um, Bill Grant and his company to play more than a um, sort of technical role in the industry going forward, um, at least until 1980, 89. Um, and so there, 
um, the, the, the president of the Congo is actually the, the current president of the, of, of the Congo, which I find quite, quite, quite amazing. Um, and he was under quite a bit of pressure um, from the IMF and the World Bank to, to privatize. I think most of you know that. Um, we've had the, really the peak of the, of the debt crisis. And so even Marxist-Leninist regimes would take advice from the World Bank and would um, privatize and what were formerly very important or intended to be very important state assets. Um, and so and really, I think the most fascinating turn um, in, this, um, in this history is that Vilgrand's company, Jean Vilgrand, the, the, the man who was the, the president at the time of the nationalization, he is now, um, he is now passed on. But his successor, also Vilgrand, um, ends up pur purchasing um, the Congolese assets that were seized from, seized from GMP um, 20, um, 20 years before. Um, and so that company, Saris, um, is still active um, all over um, Africa in the uh, agro industry and in sugar production. Um, uh, and it's quite successful. And so while the, um, the operations in 1991 upon purchase were really quite um, you know, uh, bar barely functioning, um, a recent article in the magazine Jeune Afrique, a bit of a little flattering um, a little story about, about Saris and its operations in the, the Niari Valley, um, and, and declared them a, a part of the pun, it, it's theirs, not mine, a sweet success, um, right? And so um, the Gilgrand family is making lots of, of money from, from Congolese sugar um, uh, in, in the modern era. Um, and so with that sort of narrative, I hope that wasn't, I hope that was interesting. Um, I'm happy to go into more detail. I just wanted to briefly in the last sort of five minutes of, of, of my talk, highlight some of the themes that I end up drawing from the archival um, research that I did. Um, and so one of the themes here um, is that the reason to expropriate, at least in this case, and I think in others, was really not driven by a sort of economic rationality like, um, uh, or opportunism. In other words, um, the, the idea wasn't that the Congo was necessarily seizing um, an investment after it had been sunk in order to sort of take um, it's uh, um, uh, uh, take a, 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 effectively a guaranteed stream of profits, right? Um, this was not a profitable move by the Congolese to, to, take, um, to take the operations. Um, uh, and we know that because the operations at the time of the nationalization were, um, were, um, were, um, were in dire straits, right? As I mentioned, because of the decline in, in, in sugar, um, and sugar, world sugar prices. Um, the operations really weren't profitable. And in fact, Ville Grand was, was floating the idea of abandoning, um, abandoning the Congolese sugar industry because business was so bad. And so this was not, in my interpretation, um, sort of an economics driven de um, decision, which is quite interesting because the, um, intellectual, the international political economy literature in, uh, on which I, I, I tend to read a lot, really focuses on economic rationality as the main sort of normal cause for expropriations. And here I find that to really not be the case. We have a fascinating example of personal animosity. And you know, there's some possibility that expropriation might've been driven in part by that. Um, and so um, on the one hand, you have a very flattering um, uh, Entreprise magazine uh, story about Jean Vilgrin and his African operations. It came out the year before the nationalization that described him, I've sort of paraphrased it here, you know, as, as a blue-eyed provincial cowboy, provincial, he's from Nancy in the um, east of France. He was a, a quote-unquote cowboy and he was on a grand African adventure with his sugar operations. And, and he was aiming both to make a profit, they're very clear about that, but also in the course of making a profit, he was gonna feed the, the continent um, through um, the introduction of modern methods. Now in, the um, propaganda surrounding the nationalization, um, we find a fascinating pamphlet um, that makes extraordinarily personal attacks on Jean Vilgrin's character and personality that are really quite the opposite of the Entreprise, Entreprise magazine story. Um, and so they describe him as Hitlerian, um, which I find very curious as throwing banana peels in the path of progress, a strange person, diabolical, they make a, a childish pun on his name, transforming it into vile seed, vile dash grain. Um, that animosity appear, appears to have been quite real. And so Ville Grain had burned bridges with Congolese authorities and they remained upset with him for some time. And you also find in the French diplomatic archives, um, French diplomats complaining about his abrasive and stubborn personality. Um, 
But I think the main reason for the expropriation really ended up being political in this sense. Um, uh, the Congolese government was very worried about labor unrest. Labor unrest was responsible for the downfall um, of prior presidents, and so Yulu, for example. Um, and Bill Grand's inability to tamp down the employer, the employee um, uh, dissatisfaction and discord um, in the cane fields was viewed as very, very troubling. And there's some great documents in the archival literature that really um, bring out and sort of back up sort of my assertion that um, the worry was essentially labor focused. And especially when Bill Graham, when word got out that Bill Graham was thinking of abandoning the operations, thereby, you know, if that would happen, throwing out of work um, a, a, a large contingent of, of, of young males, um, that, was, um, that, was, um, that, that was going too far. Um, and so it was that sort of threat, um, which I think also illustrates in a, in a way the sort of dependence upon um, uh, the Congolese government's dependence upon French capital in an interesting way. They're dependent upon French capital to keep their African workers happy. Um, the threat to leave and to make those workers unhappy encouraged the government to step in and keep things um, running. Um, another theme that I developed is um, the theme of a discord or divergence between the interests of the French state um, and the interests of French capitalists. And so, as I mentioned in my um, abbreviated narrative, you have the French capitalist, Villegrain, trying to bend the French government's arm on his behalf, and they consistently refuse to do so, right, for a very long time, because the French government is, is I argue, worried about its larger relationship um, with the Congolese, and they're not going to let um, a French capitalist, Jean Villegrain, um, uh, disrupt, right, or derail that larger relationship. And I think that this idea of a divergence of of interest between the government and French capitalists, I think it's interesting to think about whether it sort of goes against um, the standard sort of neo-Marxist analysis of post-colonial relationships. And so here, you know, think of um, Jean Serre Canal. I mean, his work is really, really interesting. I, I love it, um, and I've learned a lot from it. Um, but it, it tends to, to present capitalists as effectively the French state, at least in terms of interest, right? And here you see this complete divergence, right? And so my article lets us sort of ex explore and explain sort of where that divergence comes from, how it is handled. Um, and also we see um, an experience very different from US um, diplomatic experience involving US investors. And so in the US case, there's um, some great work done by a, an historian called Noel Moore at George Washington that shows that the US government is routinely sort of strong armed by private investors into taking outsized actions against um, foreign states that have mistreated US investors. We don't see that here for reasons I can talk about uh, in Q&A. Let me just quickly finish up because we're running out of time. Then the final theme that I um, talk about is post-colonial interdependence versus neo-colonialism, um, where I think the standard sort of neo-colonial approach really, you know, it, it suggests that not much changed in 1960 um, and that France is still controlling um, pretty much everything that happens on the ground. You can think of sort of articles that, you know, there's the one article with a famous title, how does France get away with everything it does in Africa? Sure, there's a lot of truth to that, right? This episode actually though, um, for reasons I can talk about in Q&A, actually shows kind of interesting um, uh, mutual dependence between all of the parties involved that I argue in the article leads them to, um, in some cases to moderate their responses to provocations like nationalization. Um, and so I think it's my next, my next slide, or I'll jump two slides here. And so for obviously, right, the Congolese government depends upon continued access to French management technology and spare parts and French budgetary and other aid, right? And so the Congolese government ends up reimbursing Ville Grant eventually, right? Because it doesn't want to ruin this otherwise sort of profitable relationship with France. You know, France can always threaten, right? There's always this implicit threat to not um, provide budgetary and other aid, et cetera, et cetera. And France obviously is dependent, especially upon access to Congolese oil, no surprise to, to you all. This is, this is the, the, the beginning of the development of the famous Emeril deposit um, off, off, off the coast. Um, and we see you know, the, in the archives, very clear evidence of the Congolese in the course of um, pushing back of Ville Grain, um, you know, suggesting, hey, French government, we're not gonna be friendly with you in our, in our negotiations over access to our oil if you insist upon us paying this nasty Bill Grand character his compensation. Um, and more generally, France 
you know, it, it, this is the time when the cooperation accord, the, the 1960 ones, the original ones are being renegotiated. And France is, all, is very, very anxious to keep the Congo within the cooperation r regime, right? Um, and so the French government has an incentive, you know, in view of the larger, so it's larger interest in the Congo, um, in, in not in not allowing Vilgrin to, um, to to muddy the waters too much. And finally, Vilgrin is Grand Moulin de Paris. You know, he depends upon a French support for um, his far-flung operations, you know, all across the continent, and he depends upon the Congolese government for access to future investments in the agro-industrial sector. Um, and so that dependence and that possibility of future profit, like in the end, although um, Vilgrin is really aggressive in pursuing compensation, at the margins at least, I think that um, uh, his dependence on both governments to, to make his profits, right? He's a free marketeer, but you know, hypocritically perhaps, he depends on government action to make that profit um, and government favors. Um, he too is in the end, I think, um, you know, convinced to, to, to to accept a compromise solution in which he gets most, but not all, but not all of what he's de de demanding. And so the final sort of takeaway, and this is where maybe it's a little controversial, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I try to draw this back to the legal literature um, and, um, and sort of argue that this system of diplomatic protection of politicized dispute settlement actually was relatively effective in some cases at sort of promoting compromised resolution in light of a, maintaining a larger relationship between various parties. Um, uh, and I speculate that legalizing um, these kinds of disputes might have actually led to um, relational harm in, in a way. Um, so that's sort of where we are. I'm out of time. Um, we have some time for Q&A, and so I'll just stop talking right now. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, so much, Jason, for a really fascinating uh, discussion of uh, of what, as you said, I mean, a specific episode, but I think it really has broader resonances for for the rest of the continent, and and uh, I think the areas that so many of us work on faced uh, similar um, circumstances and, and and similar situations with nationalization of of uh, former colonial uh, holdings and so forth. So I I really hope uh, so. Thank you for that, and I I really hope there's some uh, questions. We have um, I think about. 10 minutes or so for the Q&A. Uh, I won't be quite Hitlerian, but I, I, I uh, will be Kantian about my timekeeping. So, um, you know, at about one o'clock, uh, we hope to, to, uh, to wrap this up. So please, you can either raise your hand and ask your question or- I see Aliko Salvalo. Oh, okay. Well, I, you know, for some reason I'm not seeing this. So Aliko, please go ahead. Yes, uh, th thank you so much, Jason, for this. Uh... Very fascinating uh, case of uh, nationalization um, and uh, the delicacies of uh, colonialism, post-colonialism, and so forth. I'm fascinated by uh, a number of words, uh, but also by, you know, how these things are, are, you know, taken to court or at least taken to France for resolution. Uh, because uh, when you think of uh, Congo Brazzaville, uh, you know, it was uh, Savonien de Braza who made Congo Brazzaville a colony of France by expropriating. And it's, uh, it's a word that you use in the modern context, but you go back to 1880 mm -hmm. and actually he expropriated uh, through a very you know, nebulous uh, contract with uh, uh, chieftains who could not read uh, what they were signing. A cocoa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the other word I'm fascinated by is concession. Uh, you know, this 1929 Otino's concession of 49,000 uh, acres, you know, um, so where did that come from? I mean, who was the original owner of that concession. Um, and if, that's of course reflected a thousand times in uh, next door in the DRC, mm -hmm. where the whole country was organized uh, in terms of concessions to European uh, uh, business uh, uh, people, rubber, ivory, uh, uh, and so on. So I was wondering in terms of, um, you know, Res uh, uh, resolving these issues, 
if you go to court, where do you begin in terms of knowing who the rightful owner of whatever concession was? And shouldn't they be the ones who would have the right to expropriate? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the end, you talked about, uh, you know, you said it was, uh, you know, expropriation is ir irrational. Who is being irrational here? And, and I wonder how international courts deal with these things, because you could go as far back as France and Haiti, you know, Haiti yeah. was compensating French colonists for losing uh, their sugarcane plantations at, uh, when Haiti beat out France and kicked it out and so forth. But I'm interested in how, what, uh, where international courts begin with this sort of thing. Well, you know, it, it's it, it's a great it's a great question, Aliko. I've I've been reading a lot um, over over COVID. I read a lot um, of the early history of of you know Braza and, and the Congo. Um, the the best scholar out there is a woman um, uh, named um, Katerine Kokari Vidrovich. I think I'm saying that that right. Who's done a lot of work on the concession regime. So Atino's concession um, was part of the formal system that the French government, you know, the administration for the AEF. You know, it, it implemented it, and so they would give these out um, for for a number of years. Um, uh, the The legal question, I mean, the answer is easy. I mean, there's tabula rasa um, in 1960. As far as the international law and courts, um, um, you know, it, the way they see things is that um, you know we're not going to go back and, and, and relitigate um, um, the you know the the the, the crimes of 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 colonization. Um, you know, the, where I, 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 there are, there are no, no, no cases of the type that, I, that I'm talking about that, that go back to, the, um, to, the, to those times and try to, you know, restore title to, to those from whom it was, it was taken from, even if that is possible. Um, th that said, I mean, I agree. I mean, Aliko, there, there's huge irony here, right? I mean, the, 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 the West is demanding property rights, um, uh, but their presence is, is founded upon widespread violation of native property rights. Um, so that, that's a theme that I definitely want to explore more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I actually can't see if uh, somebody raises their hand, but if you do, Jason, just go ahead and, and um, yeah, for whatever reason, it's not appearing on my side of things, but. So. Any, any, any comments and reactions are, are fine too. Anything that I've, I've missed or anything that struck you that struck you as wrong, um, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd be happy to hear as well. Yeah. All right. I do not see. No. All right. It looks like Marissa has a question. Oh, oh I, can't, I can't see anything. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Marissa, please. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say a bit more um, about what you just said in your response to Ali Ko about the 1960 kind of tab tabula rasa stance mm -hmm. of um, courts and international courts. How does that actually happen? Uh, so it, it, at independence, I mean, the, 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 um, the former colonies, um, kind of take over the, the role of, 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 of the French government and, and, and to a very large extent, the, the French legal system, which recognized the validity of, um, of the concessions that have been granted. And so, um, you know, there are not a whole lot of, of cases and certainly not once you get past the, um, the uh, initial years. And so like, I'm thinking, for example, of like the nationalization of, um, of the, uh, um, uh, in, the um, in the Democratic Republic of, 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 um, of, of Congo, that was viewed, I think, as being politically like quite, um, quite necessary. Um, and so the, um, uh, when the mines were taken over um, in the Katanga, um, you know, there, I think most people recognize this was sort of, um, you know, undoing um, in a justified kind of way um, the previous um, allocation of, 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 of property rights. But outside of those cases, and especially where you have um, investments that have taken place, certainly post-independence, but also sort of towards the end of the colonial period, 
tribunals are just, you know, they're, they're, they're comfortable viewing that ownership as being totally legitimate because it was obtained legally under an established sort of legal system, right? And that legal system was the colonial legal system. Yeah. And so we, we just don't go back to Mokoko's treaty with Braza and say, wow, that was unfair. And, you know, he didn't understand it or he had no rights to give away what he gave away. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really viewed as, as water under the bridge um, by the time we get to the 70s. Hmm. So can I just follow up quickly? I guess I'm, I'm interested in um, if there were, because it sounds like those are essentially, you know, the, we go from kind of imperial legal relations, right, to national ones. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there are, um, or were, I'm thinking about the um, ICC, for example, if there were international legal mechanisms mm -hmm. um, that well, people had to negotiate or, or anything like that, that um, might be relevant. Well, the whole focus, um, the, the whole focus, Marissa, in like the fifth, starting in the fifties, but then in the sixties and seventies was on securing property rights um, and on uh, legally. And so the international law focus was on how can these newly independent colonies credibly promise investors, they need capital. Everyone agrees that development is the, is the basic problem of the post-colonial period. How do you get development? You need foreign capital. How do you get foreign capital? You promise that you're gonna uphold property rights. Now that's a forward looking philosophy, but it was viewed, the, the view was that if you sort of rectify prior property rights problems, that's gonna send a very bad signal to future investors. And mm. so I think that's how we get to the system where we now just ignore all the past property crimes, right? Because addressing them raises that fear then of scaring away future investors. Hmm. Right, that's so so interesting. I'm also thinking about South Africa after 1994 and this, this ongoing struggle and difficulty of restituting mm -hmm. property land. That was the biggest challenge to the system actually was the, was the litigation over the black empowerment um, uh, uh, legislation, right? And so I think that is where you see that tension sort of most developed and most real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Well, we're we are uh, we're at one o'clock, but if there's one question that somebody would really like to pose, I'll uh, I'll accept one final question. Um, but do you see any, Jason or Leah? No. I'm all, I, I'm always happy to to answer emails or or to have a coffee with anyone on on campus who wants to talk more about these issues. Yeah. Or, well, thank you so much again for a fascinating talk. Um, and uh, I hope to hear more about your research. It sounds uh, really interesting and and um, it sheds a very, a very, as you said, a, a sort of different light on on a situation that we all know, perhaps from uh, a very generalized and, and um, umbrella perspective. But um, it's really interesting to get into the sort of nitty gritty and, and the, the specifics of it. So thank you again. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, we'll see you all next week, I hope. Thank you.